Welcome to Grow Money Business, the podcast dedicated to helping business owners grow both their wealth and business on their own terms. Here's your host, Grant Bledsoe. Hello, everybody. Grant Bledsoe here. Welcome back to Grow Money Business. This week on the show, we're talking about dividend investing. Dividend investing is a popular investment strategy for a lot of people where they choose the investments that they purchase based on their dividend yield and they invest for income. And sometimes it's a good fit, but oftentimes it's a really poor fit. And come to find out, dividend investing is somewhat silly because the logical reasons that you pick the securities in the first place is actually a little bit misplaced. So we talk about all this on the show today. We talk about the details of what dividends are, where the cash comes from, and the alternatives for management who's trying to decide whether to pay a dividend or hang on to the cash each year. We go into a lot of depth on all these topics, and I hope you enjoy it. Hey, everyone. I need to interject quickly to remind you all that nothing found in today's episode or any other episode of Grow Money Business should be considered financial, investing, legal, tax, fitness, or even relationship advice. It's content that you're free to use and to deploy on your own terms. And before taking any actions on content found on the show, please do consult with your tax professional, your attorney, or your financial planner. If you don't have a financial planner, head on over to threeoakswealth.com to learn more about what we do in terms of financial planning and investments and how we help clients on an ongoing basis. This week on the show, I would like to talk about dividend investing. Dividend investing is uh, a, a strategy that a lot of people use out there for their own investment portfolios. People often have questions about it. They like the idea of dividend, dividend investing. Companies that pay good dividends and pay increasingly larger dividends have had a good track record. And so there's a lot of uh, information and articles out there that really promote dividend investing. And there are a, a whole lot of people out there that uh, will promote specific companies that pay a nice dividend. And so if you're someone out there that reads uh, the blogs or Seeking Alpha or you follow you know, dividend investing on Twitter, those people are always touting individual companies that uh, are reasonably priced and pay a really nice dividend. And so I wanted to talk about dividend investing in general today because I think uh, using it as a strategy is a little bit misplaced. I think that people who uh, are proponents and fans of dividend investing like it for a couple of reasons, but those reasons are not very well founded. There is a time and a place for it. And today on the show, I I just wanted to run through uh, my thoughts on this usage as as a strategy, when you should and should not use it, and what's really going on in in any dividend uh, investing strategy. And so what what I want to start with here is just cover what dividends are, why they are helpful to us as investors, and and why we care about them in the first place. And really, the best place to start is to talk about what you get when you buy a share of stock. When When you buy a share of stock, as most of you probably know, you're buying a very small portion of the company of that stock. And so if there are 100 shares of uh, stock that exist, you're buying 1% of that company. And that gives you potentially voting rights, depending on how the stock is structured and issued. It gives you one, it gives you rights to 1% of the earnings of that company. And so simple example, if a company has 100 shares of stock and they make $1 million in revenue that year, then they have all their expenses. So think to think what an income statement looks like. Revenues come in at the top, selling your goods and services. Then you have all your expenses underneath that. Let's say that it's seven hundred thousand dollars, and there's three hundred thousand dollars left in profits. That's a thirty percent profit margin. That's really good. And your one percent ownership of that company entitles you to one percent of that three hundred three hundred thousand dollars left at the end of the year or three grand. Now, for all intents and purposes, when we buy shares of stock in in the public markets, we are voting as shareholders on the board of directors. The board of directors is the group of people who oversees the CEO. They hire and fire the CEO. And when you own shares of stock, 
typically you have voting rights to elect those board directors. The CEO is the person or the party who, uh, along with the CFO, are going to make decisions on what to do with that 300 grand. So for most people in America who are uh, investing maybe in your retirement accounts or your 401k, you're not making those voting decisions actively. If, if you're someone who has a brokerage account and you have a whole bunch of individual stocks in that brokerage account, your broker is required to send you these uh, proxy voting uh, mess, uh, communications so that when there's a vote coming up for the board, you have an opportunity to vote your shares on them. But for most of us, we're, use, we're investing using funds because that's a superior strategy, which is a topic for another day. Uh, but it's for, for all intents and purposes, when you buy a share of a mutual fund or an ETF, the manager of that fund is responsible for voting these proxies and voting who to elect and who to elect out uh, off of that uh, board of directors. And the board of directors, again, is there to oversee the management. They hire and fire the CEO. So the CEO and the CFO are the two people who are going to get together at the end of the year and decide what to do with that extra cash. And so if there's a million dollars of revenue and $700,000 of expenses, they've got $300,000 left over. They're trying to decide how to handle. And the way that they make those decisions is based on how innovative the company is. How fast are they growing market share? How fast are they growing revenue? And we've talked about this a little bit in the past on the uh, on the show, but this uh, this comes down to growth versus value, really. And and if we're evaluating uh, a stock, so for example, let's let's say that we we like dividends and we want to take a look at um, I don't know Ford Motor Company or Johnson and Johnson or AMD, a microchip company, or, or anything, uh, we might evaluate it on this spectrum of growth to value. Because growth companies are growing rapidly, they're growing market share, they're growing revenues, they have innovative products and services that more and more people are buying and subscribing to and using. And the strategy for the company, not just financial strategy, but corporate strategy is to continue putting the, the, the pedal down and growing as fast as they possibly can on an ongoing basis. So if you're in that situation, let's say you have some cool new AI technology that's just taken over the world, growing like gangbusters. If you have a million dollars of revenue and $700,000 of expenses, you got 300 grand left over, you shouldn't be distributing that back to shareholders. You should be reinvesting that back into the company. Because if you're growing revenues and growing profits at an above average rate, if I own that company, if I have 1% of the stock in a company like that, I don't want you to give me the cash back. I want you to keep doing what you're doing and, 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 and growing at that pace that's better than what I can get in other markets around uh, or other investments around the markets. Now, on the other hand, so that what I'm describing there is a growth company, high revenue growth, high uh, profitability, innovation, growing market share, all of the above. Usually, if you're someone who's investing new money relative to the earnings that you get, they're going to be very expensive uh, uh, in terms of price and valuation. And one measure there is PE ratio, price of what that one share costs divided by the earnings that that one share is entitled to for its pro rata ownership in the corporation. And a rapidly growing company, a rapidly innovative, you know, new AI tech company that has a whole lot of possibilities in the future, well, the market's going to value that very richly. It's going to be more expensive in the marketplace than something that's growing at a slower rate because of the, the future possibilities, right? So on the other end of the spectrum, we have value companies. Ford, Procter & Gamble, Coca-Cola are all really good examples of value companies. They ain't terribly innovative. Coca-Cola has had the same recipe for, I don't know how many years, probably a hundred now. They have a whole ton of market share. They're a cash cow. They have a great business. Warren Buffett's held them and really, really loves them and has for a long time. But they're not terribly innovative. They've, they've already experienced most of the growth that the company will ever see. And so if you own a company like Coca-Cola, 
then if they have a million in revenue and seven hundred thousand dollars in in expenses, Coca Cola has way way more than that. I'm just using this hypothetically. Then, as an investor, I want some of that cash back, right? I want of that three hundred thousand dollars left over. I don't want the management plowing that cash back into the slow growing company. I want them to pay me a dividend. I want it back because I can take it and invest it elsewhere in a manner that's going to either produce a dividend or uh, uh, grow my capital in one way or another. And so there's there's a spectrum here. There's growth on the one hand. There's value on the other end. There's been a lot of uh, investigation and research recently, research, uh, recently, maybe over the last 20 years, surrounding what kinds of companies tend to do better for investors. Because on one hand, I'm not buying Amazon. I'm not buying that new AI tech company because it's inexpensive. I might have to pay a lot just to get into the thing. And so if I'm paying a lot for one share of stock, the company is going to have to make good on those growth opportunities that they have in front of them. They're going to have to continue growing and the price is going to have to go up further from the high level that it's at when, when you buy it in order to produce a reasonable return. You're not buying it because it's cheap. You're buying it because of the future potential. On the other end of the spectrum, the value spectrum, you're not buying Coca-Cola because it's innovative. You're buying it because it's inexpensive and it is just has this great stable money-making machine that will kick off some cash in the form of a dividend. So your returns come from two different places. Now, a lot of people that I've come across have this impression that dividend investing should consist of picking companies that have great dividend yields and then purchasing them or, or at least purchasing the ones that have the highest yields first. And that's uh, not a terribly great way to go about it. What I mean when I say dividend yield is how much, uh, what, what the size of the annual dividend is that you're entitled to as an investor and divided, divide that by the price at which that share of stock trades. So if, if it's a company, and I'm going to use Coca-Cola again as, as an example, that pays a $2 per year dividend, maybe they split it up into 50 cents every quarter, it really doesn't matter. But in the, over the course of a year, they have this trend of paying $2 per share of a dividend and one share of stock costs $100. That means that your dividend yield is 2%. Of every thousand bucks that you put into that stock, you can maybe expect $20 in dividends. Well, if your dividend yield is abnormally high, right? We could we could pull a list pretty easily of of like the the Russell three thousand or the three thousand you know biggest by market cap uh, companies in the U.S. stock markets, and we could filter them by or sort them, I should say, by highest dividend yield first, and say that one looks pretty good. Well, you might see something that that at the top of the list, some company that's paying like a nine percent dividend yield because the price has just maybe cratered and the denominator in that equation has uh, gotten a lot lower. The thing is when high dividend yields or, or when dividend yields become too high, they become unsustainable for the management. Because if you're it's paying a 9% dividend yield means that for every $100 of equity in the company, $9 of that is going to go right back to shareholders. And remember that equity in the company doesn't just consist of the profits that the company produced this year. It consists of the retained earnings and the rest of the equity base. And what you don't want as an investor is a company to be forced to maintain a really high dividend yield and run through all their cash and all their assets and all their resources just to maintain some silly dividend yield to you as an investor. What you're trying to do as an investor is find comp find the best profit making machines out there for better or worse, you know, society wise for better or worse, I should say. But as investors, we we're buying these profit making machines and you want a machine that is going to produce reliable earnings regardless of whether 
they're paid back to you through a dividend or whether they're reinvested back into the company for future growth. What you don't want is just to choose the, the, the company with the highest dividend yields because that's not going to be sustainable for too long. Either they're going to have to reduce the, the, the dividend paid out to investors or they're going to have to improve operations somehow in order to, to substantiate that. That's another risk of dividend investing. We, so previous example, if, you're, if you own a stock that pays $2 per share and the stock costs $100 to, to purchase in the open market, you have a 2% dividend yield. But that 2%, that $2 a share isn't guaranteed. That's just what the ownership wants to send you. And so what companies will sometimes do is when times are tough, they'll reduce their dividend yield. That, that's a really common and, and totally reasonable thing for CEOs and CFOs to do. If they hit a rough patch in operations and their earnings and profits are down, they're not going to have as much cash to left, left over at the end of the year to distribute to shareholders. So they have to reduce the dividend that's paid out. And what some companies will do, and, and the banks were notorious for this back in the mortgage crisis in 2008, 2009, when times get really tough, they'll cut their dividend yield to one penny per share. So if you think of why, why on earth would, would they do that? I'm, I'm getting 2% dividend yield on a $100 uh, dollar per share of stock. I'm getting $2 uh, per share in dividends. Why would they slash it to a penny? Why wouldn't they just make it zero and just keep that extra penny? It seems nonsensical. And for us as investors, it absolutely does. But what it, uh, what it allows the management to do is claim that they've consistently paid a dividend to investors every single year for the last 50 or the last 70. And it allows them to keep that track record uh, going, which is favorable to, for, for people who are investing for dividend purposes. So it's, some, it's somewhat silly. Um, now, back to this concept of value versus growth. I uh, started saying a few minutes ago that there's been a lot of research into which type of investing does better? Does value do better or does growth do better? And most of the research over multiple periods of time, multiple business cycles and long periods of time, I should say, point to value doing a little bit better than growth. I'm not saying, you know, way better, uh, 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 hands and feet above, uh, above growth. And it depends on which time frame you look at. You know, if you're using a 10 or a 20 year period, there are a whole lot of 10 and 20 year periods where, where growth does better than value. But if you stretch it out over multiple business cycles, multiple market cycles over a really long period of time, value consistently tends to do a little bit better than growth. And I don't really know what the reason for that is. It's just kind of what happens. And so when we in invest money here at our firm, we like to tilt our portfolios in that direction just a little bit, not because... I don't know, not because I know what's going to happen over the next year or a few years, but just because that's been the long-term historical trend. We don't want to abandon growth entirely. We just want to, you know, instead of instead of being tilted toward growth, which is true in, in cap-weighted indexes, we want to tilt the other way just a little bit toward toward value because that's just tends to be what, what does a little bit better. So <clears throat> value tends to do better. And when I say value, I mean based on price to earnings ratios, price to book, price to sales ratios. That's typically how we determine value. And price to earnings, I mentioned earlier, you take a price at which a share of stock trades divided by its earnings, that gives you PE ratio. And so a value stock is usually classified as uh, a company with a lower PE ratio. Because again, when you're buying Coca-Cola, you're you're not you know buying uh, some innovative new new growth uh, money making machine. You're buying in a stable earnings stream that's cheap. And on the growth side, they're going to be more expensive because of all that future opportunity. Price to book is price of a share of stock divided by the book value of equity that that share is in, entitled to. It's another measure of value. Earnings, so in PE ratio, earnings is the denominator. In price to book, book value of equity is the denominator. There are, there's opportunity for 
uh, chicanery is one, one way to say it. Uh, from an accounting perspective with these companies, they can kind of defer or accelerate earnings in uh, on a year-to-year basis. So some people will use an average of the last five years or 10 years of earnings, which is a good way to do it. Uh, another way to do it is to strip out the expenses and use price to sales. And I say strip out the expenses because if you use earnings as your denominator, earnings are what's left over after you add your revenues and subtract all your expenses from them on the income statement. Earnings are what's left over. Price to sales, if you substitute sales for earnings, sales is your revenues at the top of the income statement. And so there's not less opportunity for chicanery because you're stripping all the expenses out of the equation. And so a higher price to sales, a higher price to book, higher price to earnings is what we use to define growth companies. A lower valuation measures is is usually what we uh, use to describe value companies. I'm going in circles a little bit here, but I I, want to make this point clear. (laughs) Investing in value companies, you think, well, why would I want to put my money in something that's not growing very quickly? Why would I want to put, put my money in something that doesn't have great future prospects? It's because it's a stable company that kicks off a lot of cash flow. And your returns as an investor are from dividends, price appreciation. So if you buy the stock at $100 and it goes up to $150, that's a big component of it. If you invest in mutual funds, there's capital gains distribution or mutual funds or ETFs, there's capital gains distributions that result from the activity within the fund. And so value just tends to do a little bit better than growth. And even as surprising as that sound, these stable cash cows just tend to do well, either because there's been a short-term misplacement, either the value, either the company is worth a little bit more than the market thinks it is, or because it kicks off a lot of cash flow. And I think what dividend investors get wrong is they evaluate companies and and, uh, investment opportunities, they evaluate the merits of it based on the dividends that the company kicks off. When that's not the only component of return, uh, there are a lot of value stocks that pay a very small dividend in terms of dividend yield, but are great buys because they're, they're just inexpensive relative to what you get. And from an investor's perspective, I don't care whether the management is using that cash left over at the end of the year to pay a dividend back to me, or maybe to take it and repurchase shares of that company, which I'll cover in just a second, um, through, through share repurchasing, or they take the cash and do something else with it. As long as they're producing an adequate return for me as the investor and the owner of the company, I'm okay with it. What I'm not okay with is if a value company is not a good steward of cash and the CEO and CFO get together and they have 300 grand left over at the end of the year and say, hey, I got an idea. Let's go, uh, let's go send the employees on some expensive corporate retreat and burn all that cash and have like a three-week party where we, we have keggers every single day. If they burn through the cash and don't produce an adequate return for me as an investor, that's what's upsetting. And that's exactly why these value companies that are good investment opportunities often do pay a dividend yield. Because the CEO and the CFO, they have cash left over at the end of the year. Well, what do we do with it? We pay it back to the investors, or do we reinvest it back into the company? And the exact calculus they're going through is, well, what would we do if we took that cash and reinvested it back into the company? How much do we think we can make from that? And is that going to be an adequate return for our investors or are they going to be upset with us? What is our track record for paying dividends? What what are they expecting us to do? What are the opportunities for this extra cash? Because if I can go take cash and earn 10% per year on some other kind of investment opportunity, but the company takes it, the 300 grand, reinvest it in the, in the company and only grow at 6% per year, that makes me upset. So that's, that's the calculus going on behind the scenes. And, and the, return, the excess returns from value stocks are, you know, maybe, maybe one of these companies that's considered a value stock 
had uh, bad news recently and the market has uh, punished the company and the stock is really inexpensive right now, but they don't pay a dividend, maybe that's a short term thing. And they're inexpensive because of the recent bad news. But really, the reaction by the market was uh, more than what, what should have happened. There are all sorts of circ- circumstances like that. And a company in that situation might not have uh, a dividend that it pays, meaning that it wouldn't show up on a lot of filters if you're filtering for dividend-paying stocks, dividend-paying investments, uh, but it might still be a great investment opportunity. And, and, and so back to why I think that this strategy of dividend uh, investing is often misplaced in general, dividend investing does great because it just happens to put you in a bunch of value stocks, which tends to be a great invest in, investing strategy on its own. If you, if you have a universe of 3,000 different companies and you filter them by uh, dividend yield and you pick the top 100, there are going to be some dogs in there because some of, those, some of those companies have an unsustainable dividend yield, which we were talking about. But most of them are just inexpensive relative to the earnings that they produce, so they happen to be value stocks. And having that exposure to value is what's driving the long-term returns, not necessarily the fact that it pays a dividend. And so, and there are probably dividend investors out there listening to this that say, well, an increasing annual dividend is a good indication that the company is managed well, that it's, it's improving profitability and that it's a good longer term investment. It's a, they have a good track record. They have momentum. And yes, all those things are true, but they're beside the point. There's still a value security. And I'd much rather take the universe of value securities just as a bundle, just buy all of them, including the dogs, in an index format than I would try to cherry pick the, div, the highest yielding uh, uh, dividend paying companies. Because I... I and, and there, there are studies. I can't cite the studies off the top of my head, but but people have investigated this, and it's just kind of silly. Now, <clears throat> that's not to say that all dividend investing is silly. There is a very real benefit to dividend investing, and that's if you need some income from your portfolio. Dividend investing is a very reasonable way to go about it, and the main reason for that is if you if you have one million dollars in a taxable brokerage account. Right now, you could buy a bunch of, I don't know, 12-month government bonds and probably get like 4.5% on them, which is a pretty good yield in this environment. But in a taxable account, the interest that you're paid on bonds is taxed as income. If you're in the 35% tax bracket, that 4.5% or 45 grand, you're paying 35% federal taxes on them, if that's your tax bracket. And the cool part about this, about dividend investing, is that if you've held the position, I think you have to hold it for 60 days before it pays a dividend. But if it's a qualified dividend, and most dividends that publicly traded corporations will uh, will send to investor, will pass to investors, those are considered by and large qualified dividends. You pay less in tax on qualified dividends in, in a taxable account like that. And the the rate that you pay is the same as the long term capital gains brackets, or long term capital gains rates. So if your income is below, I don't know what it is this year, maybe eighty five, eighty seven thousand dollars as a married couple, you pay zero percent federal income tax on a qualified dividend, which is pretty cool. If it's above that amount, you pay fifteen percent. If it's above, uh. I can't remember what the top bracket is, but if you have a a fairly large amount of income, then it jumps from 15 to 20%. And at some point, the net investment income tax applies as well, which could be, which is uh, 3.8%. So even if you're in the highest tax bracket, interest income, the highest tax bracket right now is 37% plus the extra 3.8% net investment income tax which is 40.8% total, compare that to 23.8% in a qualified dividend. So as I I don't believe that investing in dividend stocks as 
uh, just a general investment strategy is a good way to identify great companies. I don't think it's, it's just logically not sound to me. But if you need to pull income from your portfolio on a regular basis, having some exposure to dividend stocks makes, makes a whole lot of sense because it's uh, advantageous from a tax perspective. Now, you can get the same tax benefits from ordinary invest, like non-dividend investing. You invest in a broad index fund. You invest in only growth companies. The qualified dividend tax rate is the same as the long-term capital gains rate. So if you're investing in only growth companies that don't pay a penny of dividends, hang on to the things for a year and the same tax brackets are going to apply. So I, it's it for, for people out there that need to draw income uh, out of their, their taxable accounts, yeah, you know, it, it, it can work. I don't really have an issue with it. But just remember that companies have total discretion surrounding whether they pay the dividend at all. At all. And when times get tough, that's really the first thing that they look at is, is slashing the dividend. And that's why bonds need to be a portion of your portfolio if you're, if you're investing for income. Because the bondholders have an obligation to pay you, excuse me, the bond issuers have an obligation to pay you, the bondholder, the interest rate that's stated on the security whether or not times are tough or not. So it, it's, it's a more stable source of income. Uh, and in down markets, it's, it's just incredibly common that, that companies will slash dividends. It's really the first thing that they look to. Now, I mentioned something a few minutes ago, and that's uh, uh, the option to repurchase shares. Share repurchases have been in the news over the last couple of years. Uh, they, it's been in the political sphere political rhetoric here recently, and it's a really dumb idea to tax this, by the way. Uh, but a share repurchase is, back to our example, $1 million in revenue, $700,000 in expensive expenses, you have 300 grand left over. Well, if you have 100 shares of the company that exist, with that 300 grand, you could maybe in, reinvest 100,000 of it back into the company. Now you have 200 left over. You could take that 200 and pay a 2% dividend, 2% of the stock price. We remember, remember we're assuming that they're worth $100 a share. So that would work out to a 2% dividend. Or you could take that 200,000 and purchase shares of the stock that exist on the open market. And in this example, my math is way off, right? If, if there's $300,000 of earnings uh, and there's 100 shares of stock that exist, the price of these uh, shares is going to be way more than $100 based on market forces. So to, to elaborate on our example here a little bit, let's say that each share of stock, let's say that costs, uh, I don't know, $2,500. So the CEO and the CFO could take the 300 grand left over and they could purchase shares of stock that exist on the open market. And if there are only 100, and let's say that there's a, a, an adequate market for these and they change hands um, quite a bit, then the CEO and the CFO take the cash, they purchase the shares, not for themselves, but on behalf of the corporation. Let's say that they purchase 10 shares, just hypothetically. Well, they retire those shares or, or keep them as in, in treasury stock. And that means that now there are only 90 shares of the company that exist instead of 100. So if you own one share of the company, that one share is immediately worth more than it was before the share repurchase because previously you owned 1%, 1 divided by 100. But now you own more than 1%, 1 divided by 90. And so your your ownership rights have just gone up. Your um, uh, ownership uh, portion to future earnings has just gone up. And if you look at the math between what's more beneficial for shareholders, is it is it issuing that three hundred grand as a dividend or repurchasing shares of stock? And I know it's kind of hard to conceptualize with this easy example um, having just a hundred shares to work with, but. Corporations, the S&P 500 companies have millions and millions and millions of shares that exist out there on the markets. And, and the, the way that the math works out from a corporate finance perspective is share repurchases 
are exactly as beneficial to shareholders as uh, dividends are. If you take whatever money is left over at the end of the year, it doesn't matter to shareholders whether it's uh, um, a, a repurchase or a, a payment of dividend in a tax-free world. We don't live in a tax-free world, so sometimes the share repurchases are a little bit better because uh, you don't pay tax on that as um, as an investor. If they issue a dividend and you have the shares in a taxable account, that dividend is, is taxable, like we talked about. If it's in an IRA or a 401k or something like that, then it's not taxable. Now, dividend or, or repurchase share repurchases have been somewhat controversial and, and have been in the news over the last five years or so. And they fall into the, in a lot of people's minds, this maneuver from a corporate finance perspective falls into the bucket of financial chicanery. It's not. It's directly beneficial to shareholders because it reduces the number of shares that exist and thereby grows your portion uh, of ownership in, in that company. But a lot of politicians are upset about this because they think that it's a uh, backdoor way to boost earnings and boost executives' own compensation. Because remember, these guys are paid in bonuses that depend on stock price and all that. And so if they go on the markets and they, like five years ago, when, inter when interest rates were super low, a lot of companies would go out and issue a whole bunch of debt and then take that cash in and repurchase the company's own shares to uh, uh, reduce the equity base and boost earnings. I don't feel like this is, uh, um, you know, untoward or black hat or, or again, it, it's well within all the rules. It's not chicanery. The math uh, it favors doing that. Now, the incentive system for how those uh, executives are compensated needs to, you know, accommodate for this kind of stuff. They should be incentivized to preserve and grow revenues and earnings and shouldn't be able to juice their own compensation just by doing this kind of stuff. And that does happen and, and is part of the you know uh, political argument. But by and large, uh, buybacks are, are not a bad thing in and of themselves. They're a good thing for the investor base. And the investors are who we're all trying to protect with this governance, with all the governance and fiduciary laws that we have. So it's not a bad thing on the outset. There's a lot of momentum uh, from the Democrats recently to tax buybacks and impose some kind of barrier against executives doing this. Uh, that's it's silly and that's stupid, in my opinion. I, 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 I can see putting some barriers against executives juicing their own compensation or, or moving forward with buybacks just to increase their bonus for that year just to increase the amount of their stock compensation or what their stock compensation is, is worth. There should be some kind of barriers there, but we, we don't want to just unilaterally uh, tax buybacks because there are a lot of legitimate circumstances where the executive's pay isn't going to change one bit by doing it, but it helps the investor base uh, at large. And, and we need to accommodate for that. So that's where we're at. Dividend investing is is good because it gives you exposure to value companies. And the whole idea here is we don't want to be in the business of picking what companies are going to do better than others and avoiding those that have worse prospects. We want to we want to buy them all because that's what's going to lead you to a better outcome. It's been confirmed and reconfirmed in the academic sphere and with empirical data over and over and over again. And the people that can pick the individual companies that are going to do better, whether it's because they produce the best dividend yield now, or because they've had a track record of growing dividends, or because they have good future prospects, or be like the manager or something else, the people that do that consistently are simply lucky. Because there's a lot of people that do that. If there's a million, if there's 100,000 investment managers out there, at least of maybe five of them engaging this activity are going to have good returns for five years in a row because it's the law of large numbers. The better approach is just buying everything, leaning the weight of those holdings. If there's 3,000 stocks in the Russell 3000, you buy all 3,000 
and you just lean the weights toward companies that have characteristics that tend to outperform. And companies that pay good dividends tend to outperform because they're value companies. <laughs> but there's a lot of other good value companies that don't pay, pay dividends that we don't want to omit, omit from that equation. We need to include those as well. And doing so will uh, improve your, your long-term returns. Okay, I hope I didn't jump around too much in this episode, but this this trend, this idea of dividend investing, you know, we covered it a, a couple of years ago, and it just keeps popping up, and it's it's somewhat silly if you don't have income needs or you're trying to produce that income in a taxable account, or excuse me, a tax advantaged account. If you're try if you need to produce income in a taxable account, you wind up paying a little bit more in tax uh, by investing in dividend yield stocks. You save a little bit more on tax, I I should say, uh, than uh, by purchasing dividend yield stocks. But by and large, it's, um, it's a silly strategy. Okay, that's it for today. Hope this was helpful and I'll talk to you all again soon. Thanks for tuning in to Grow Money Business, the podcast dedicated to helping business owners grow both their wealth and business on their own terms. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you digest podcasts to ensure you don't miss out on future episodes and announcements. And feel free to submit questions to growmoneybusiness.com.